those born of God have no desire to accuse. They do have a desire to lift up others, even in the face of stupidity. They call Jesus stupid for what he was doing. They're not going to call you anything greater or anything less. They're going to call you stupid also. They sought to kill Jesus when he was in the streets. And they spoke, he, listen, he spoke about the pure authority of the Father going directly to the people and not going through the Pharisees and all these other folks. They don't like that either. An advocate of Satan will always want the power to flow through them first. They don't want people to have anything directly. That same control mechanism is how this world is formed. It's called a chain of command. People see that as a good thing because they don't know any different. What the Lord gave us, he gave us directly through his son. You don't have to go through anybody to receive the truth. Just simply ask the Lord. And because you're partakers of the Holy Spirit, maybe you don't operate by the power of the Holy Spirit, but you have the spirit of truth, or you could not believe in Yahshua HaMashiach the way you do. Since that is true, recheck your heart. What has really happened is wounds cause your thoughts to be jumbled up. They change the way you see and they make you bitter. They hurt every time they're touched. Thus, you will never be healed, but you will incur greater wounds in your life. The Lord stands ready to heal. In fact, he decreed healing over you. But you can only receive that healing in a very specific way. See, the Lord gave us a warning about healings also. My goodness, all these things are in the Word of God. He told that man of whom he restored his body. You know what he said? Go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Well, what does that mean? Same thing he said about the demons. If a demon is cast out of a person, that demon is going to go out and find nothing but dry places. He's going to come back and inspect the vessel he was kicked out of. If he finds that house swept clean, he's going to come back with seven more worse than he is to inhabit that person. And the person's in condition will be worse than the first. So that means if God heals you, he's going to make you whole. He's not going to heal you and not have you whole. He's going to make you whole. Now, if you're whole, but you're desirous, they're not totally toward him. You're going to mess your own life up again. You're going to enter back into error willingly. And your end condition is going to be worse than the first. Those things, when they're cast away from you, they will follow you for the rest of your life. Should you look back like in Sodom and Gomorrah, here they come. That's why the lesson of Sodom and Gomorrah is so important. Can you all see that truth of what Jesus said, of the stories in the Bible, and the warnings of the prophets? Can you see how big of a warning that is? Yes, it's a blessing, but you have to be prepared to receive the blessings of the Lord, or you could have a fatal end to it. Can you guys see the truth of that? We have a Father that has given us warning so that we could grow. See, he does not want to lose us. So he tells us what happens to those who could be lost. He gives us example after example of the fate of those who go against love itself, their own first nature. God's not a dictator. He's asking us to choose him in everything that we do. I find that to be amazing. He's not telling us to choose him. He's not forcing us to choose him. He's asking us to choose him. He designed this process that by our choice, we will live or die. Because what we choose is what we really want to do. And what you really want to do is who you are. And who you are, that carries your eternal identity. If you belong to the Lord right now, if you're one of those born of God, I already know you're going to be okay. I know you are. I just know you're going through a process of learning. You're not going to perish. You know why? Because they know that it grieved God that he made man once. They don't want to be one of those children who disregard the Father's love upon their lives. You see, when the average temperature is 125, and I've said this before, and your ceiling tiles are curling up and melted, when your sheetrock on the inside of your house is hot to your touch, when you cannot get into your car because of the sun's heat, and these are no exaggeration, when you experience this in January, where there should be snow, when the trees stop growing because they're weather beaten by heat, when the flood waters is at your front door, but you can't drink it, and the stench becomes unbearable because of dead things in it, when the rodents die off in great numbers after they migrate, and when man finally initializes many things by an unscheduled launch that will fail miserably and kill millions, some people will wake up even more but many will not, because the word says they won't. When more people die, and sickness spreads, and cholera becomes a problem again, 
when supplies run short, like the granaries that have been exhausted, like the farms that have been destroyed, like the farmers who are going out of business in less than 34 hours because their subsidies have been shut off. When places like Walmart withdraw contracts from all those folks who made things because they can't survive in this economic environment, even though our economy is supposed to be good, when they continue to be propped up by logistics of the military, and that's what's truly causing them to survive. When the financial system changes, and those who make phones end up making credit cards because they have changed the system period of money, and it runs through software now, and that software is regulated by an AI machine. Well, when all those things take place, which they are right now underneath your nose, some will wake up and some won't. When volcanism strips the coastlines and everybody's running away from the coasts because they can't breathe. When you smell sulfur day after day, some will wake up, many won't. And finally, when men go into their own places, when they hide within themselves because they're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb that they knew about all this time, people will see that. Some will change, many won't. Because they never knew that the time to change is now. But the walk to endure what will come upon the earth will try the best of us on purpose. That it will not pass us. We're going to go through it. Those who trust in the Lord are not going to have a problem with it. Those who don't trust in the Lord are going to whine every single day. And many of those will end up hating God. Just like those in Revelation. To blaspheme God you can only do that if you knew him. You cannot disrespect something you don't know anything about. Because in that regard, all of us disrespected God. And if you can be forgiven of blaspheming God and blaspheming Jesus, but not the Holy Spirit. Yet in Revelation, you hear about a lot of people blaspheming God, blaspheming Christ and his tabernacle and everybody else who dwells in it. And you hear of a loyalty to the Antichrist who worships the God of force. Then you realize the attitude and the way of living that people have now is the environment of the Antichrist, where people have to have proof for everything, but they're not going to receive it, though they believe a book and they cannot write to the author or anything else. Strangest thing. In other words, if they like you, they like you, and if they don't, they don't. These are strange days. And even though we can see it in part, some will wake up and some will not. We don't control who wakes up and who does not. We can assist in the Lord waking people up. The Lord is the one that grants sight to the blind. The Lord is the one that can make a person aware. We can assist in that, but we're not doing that. The Lord is. So that makes every single moment that we have now precious for the real breakthroughs. Not to be spoiled with the substance of this earth, but to be strengthened by way of our faith. Because the word of the Lord is true is the only truth we can ever have. Man's truth is not the truth. I love the Word of God because if, if, listen, if we didn't have this Word, if we didn't have this correction, would any of us walk a straight line with the Lord? We would go astray, wouldn't we? No wonder to be approved of the Lord requires study and effort on our part. It's almost like a sign that we give the Lord that we're ready to walk in his ways, we begin to study his words, study it to show thyself approved. Because we put forth effort to find him and to seek him diligently in his ways, not what comes down through the grapevine, not these sayings that mutate over the course of years, not this relaxed way of serving the Lord, but a consistent way that the Lord has given us, a standard he never moved away from, so that nothing lacking will be attached to us. All of us can be full, and all of us can be delivered, and all of us lack nothing. Because if we didn't do that, we would continue to perpetuate the hearsays that are being passed down. Like these young children, they don't know where to begin. This knowledge is not even in them to a large degree. It really isn't. I know I couldn't survive without the Lord's Word, and I'm thankful for it. You have to be 100% not hard-headed to receive all things of the Spirit perfectly. I already know I'm hard-headed. I know that. I know also sometimes I have a tendency to be lazy. Lazy as in, Lord, show me, so I don't have to hunt for it. That's why I love this word. It does not agree with me. It corrects me. 
I don't want to read something that agrees with me because I know I am a mere man of flesh. Why would I want a word that agrees with me? If something agrees with me, it must be wrong. But when something corrects me, and when I bear witness to that correction, and when I get excited about the correction, it can only be from the Lord. See, there's promise behind God's correction. There's a smile behind God's correction, not tears, a smile. It means, all right, I can get it right this time. That's what I thought the first time, but somehow I was talked into doing it the other way. I don't know where it came from, but I'm going to stop doing it. Lord, I should have done it your way the first time. Thank you for showing me this. Anybody else bearing witness to these sayings? Don't we do that? In our hearts, in in us resides the truth, but we don't always do it. We tend to go along with what everybody else approves. And then all of a sudden, when we study the Word of God, we find out, wait a minute, I shouldn't have done that. Thank you, Lord. You gave me the truth. I should have done it the way that you gave it to me. Without ever reading it, you already gave it to me. Forgive me. And then we ask for forgiveness, and then we are back on track again. And we feel good about that, being back on track. But you always feel a little shifty. When you start doing stuff man's way, then you, most of the time, you end up knowing, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But you did it anyway. But you know you shouldn't have done it. But when you read the words, it is very strong confirmation. It will put a smile on your face because it's written in black and white. How can somebody write something in black and white that confirms the truth so deeply embedded within you? That's why you smile with a correction. Nevertheless, it is correction. It's life-saving. And you know it.